in the memory of Sister Lenny Hemphill, who has passed into the fullness of a mortal life and now abides in the mercy and care of our Heavenly Father. We come together in loving sympathy, faith, and hope. In sympathy, our hearts are joined in acknowledgement of sacred ties now severed and of memories tenderly cherished. In faith, we state our firm assurance that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In hope, we recall the words of Christ. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Let us remain in prayer. Our Father, whose love has created us and given to us the high and solemn privilege of love, we thank you for the assurance that thou hast given us in the eternal life which lies in thy Son. In these moments, as we give together in solemn privilege and in loving memory, deepen our sympathy. Increase our faith and brighten our hope. May we not mourn as those for whom there is no hope. Rather, may we look forward with assurance to a morning with joy with thee. We thank thee for the life of her, beloved by us and dear to the hearts of many, for your thoughtfulness of others, for her thoughtfulness for others, for her gentle heart to him for her example of lowly courtesy and devotion to thee, we give thee grateful thanks. Bless and console all who are precious to her and to whom she is dear. Inspire us with patience and fortitude. Get together in friendliness and love, and may we help to lift the burden of woe from helpless, bereaved children. May we be filled with sympathy for the sufferings of others, and inspire us to higher service and nobler living. So may the memory of our dear departed be a blessing unto us forever. Amen. In this hour of darkness, where the pure light that shines upon the pathway of life, we come from the loving care of our God, whose star of hope continues to shine in the darkness of our grief. Sisters, brothers, and friends, as we stand in the solemn presence, may we hear the voice of our Heavenly Father speaking to us. Listening to Him, may we learn that life is not in vain. Its fruits are not at the mercy of chance or the ravages of time. Our God is just. We know that as our teacher was faithful to the convictions of right and duty, as he was obedient to the demands of honor and justice, as he was loyal to kindred and friends, as he was guided by the trust of faith in the hour of trial, and as he lived in the spirit of purity and love of truth, so shall she be rewarded. We walk by faith, not by sight. Sustained by his faith, may we go from this place of mourning and this hour of reflection with the inspiration of new hope and earnest purpose for our life. The emblem and symbol of our order keep that many useful and impressive lessons. They come to us in this hour with increased meaning. The true and lasting values of life become more cherished in the face of death. The sisters of our star, who represent the ascended heroines of our order, present their figures with offerings of sisterly affection. Their voices are often heard from the several points of stars, and in the ritual of our order, they symbolize the virtues which should adorn our lives. Blue symbolizes humility, and the treasure is that of the star. Blue, in the morning of her life, surrendered to the grave, the brightest of earthly hope that she might be faithful to her condition of right and preserve her father's honor. The blue light of the star shines here to remind us of her fidelity and love. Now I'll spend the last question. Teaching faithful obedience 
his demand to file a complaint. Drew is simply filing for encouragement and Elmer Stacy and Salt for the propriety of the Drew decree. The yellow ray of our scholar shine through the keystroke to his constant, steadfast inquiry. What symbolizes life's purity joy? The hull, cool air truck of a river for purity of her mother, a mother of tender and sin. By her willingness to risk the loss of form and life to save his people from ruin, the white ray of our star shines here to teach us that we should be loyal to our kindred and friends and to our God. Martha decided to believe her husband was a friend, a vow of her trustful faith and hope of immortal life. The green ray of our star shines here to assure us our spiritual entry into the joy of immortality. Red symbolizes sovereignty and will. Election representing service to our true women, character, and heroics in endurance under the wrongs of persecution. The red ray of our star shines here to symbolize the fervency of our love for our sister and of her love for us. beautiful flowers are the highest expression of nature's loveliness, yet they are but dim reminders of the glories that may be unfolded to us in the spiritual vision. We have but to keep the faith, and we too shall join the loved ones by the flow. Thank you, Martin Paul. Our God, when we live a year or have our being, we thank thee that thou hast given foundation to our faith, and the word of thy son, who coming to earth was heralded like a star in the east. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. We come to thee in this hour of sadness and ask that we may learn well the lessons of life so that when it shall be our turn to lay aside this mortality, we may do it with trust and faith in thee, looking with assurance to a glorious immortality through thy love. Look with tender compassion upon these thy children, whose household has been broken. Sanctify this bereavement to the good of us all, and let us be the means of drawing us closer to thee. Grant that we may find comfort in him who is the great comforter of us all. Amen. So may it be.
welcome, friends, to this final service for Linny Hedgebeth. We gather today to remember Linny, to give thanks for her long and fruitful life, to pray with those who mourn, to hear in scripture words of hope and new life, and finally, to commend Linny into the hands of a loving and merciful God. On behalf of her family, thank you for being here. Your presence honors Linny and comforts her children. Immediately following the service, the interment will take place at Sherwood Burial Park. And after the interment, everyone is invited to a reception in the Eastern Star Chapter Room. Please come, it's an opportunity to be together, to share stories, and to continue the celebration. One small note about the service, the congregation's responses are marked in the service leaflet in bold. I invite you to join in with everyone in saying them. Let us begin with prayer. O oh God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day your servant Linny. We thank you for giving her to us, her family and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your compassion, console those who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of Christ so that we may live in confidence and hope until by your call we are gathered into the company of all your saints. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Let us hear the word of God. reading from Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow of well-aged wines, strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand if you are able and let us say Psalm 121. We will read the psalm in unison. I lift up my eyes to the hills, from where is my help to come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved, and he who watches over you will not fall asleep. Behold, he who keeps watch over Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand, so that the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. It is he who shall keep you safe. The Lord shall watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. Please be seated.
It is my privilege to bring to you the word of God from Romans 8, 31 through 39. Here's the word of the Lord. And I just want to say the yellow ray of the star really speaks to me. Lenny was my Aunt Dormy. I am Athena. I'm Snooky's daughter. And uh, the yellow star just really speaks to me, or the yellow ray of the star, in consistency and just her perseverance. And Dormy faced many trials in life, but how she faced them in perseverance and going through and with wit and with joy of life, it is, was a testimony to me, and she was a real mentor to me. So it's a real privilege to be here. So thank you for the, so hear the word of the Lord. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, he will not with him also giving us everything else. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life. (laughs) We can do this. Nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you, Lulu. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lulu. Dormy's daughter. With me is my best friend, Denise, who's my pinch reader today. So it's not just you, Athena. Uh, My brother, Roger, my husband, Satch, family and friends have consulted as to what we should say about mom. You know, it's not easy to condense 93 years into a few sound bites. (laughs) Cousin Netsy gave us good direction, though. You all knew mom, or at least knew of her, You have your own memories. All we need to do is bring them to mind. Let us begin by saying that mom would be tickled to see you all and that she might be a little embarrassed, or maybe not, to be the center of attention. Either way, she'd get with the program and tell you about herself and leave you with a few final life lessons too. Dormy was the seventh of nine children in the Red household in Beaverdam, Virginia, near King's Dominion. Our uncle Johnny, who's here today, was witness to what went on there. But we know that A.W., the dad who carried mail for more than 50 years, and Bessie, the mother who put housework aside in favor of reading, produced a crop of four boys and five girls, bright, independent, strong-willed kids who teased one another unmercifully, got into mischief with very little effort, and learned early on the importance of looking out for each other. The family weathered the Depression years together, grateful that A.W. had a good job and that his wife Bessie and magistrate dad Jim ran a country store in the side yard. Supper out of the store might have been crackers and canned salmon, but they ate like kings because they were together. 
Like most of her friends, mom learned to sew at home, a skill that enabled her to make clothes for us, reupholster a sofa, or run up pinch pleat drapes. We recently came across an undated newspaper notice about mom's commitment to the 4-H. She won a $5 scholarship to go to a 4-H course in Blacksburg because of her excellent attendance record and her well-made table mats. Mom and her 53 classmates graduated from Beaverdam High School in 1944 when World War II was in full swing. She contributed to the war effort by acting as a plane spotter, heading up the spotting tower either before or after school to identify the silhouettes of enemy planes. So far as we know, she never found any. In summers, she headed to Washington, D.C., where she worked in government offices. At her Pentagon job, she must have been a real sight. Running down the halls with her new friend, Marion, hey, Nathan, in full view of top brass, one girl saying to the other, oh, stop it. They'll think we're just in high school. So during the later war years, mom was a student at Randolph-Macon Men's College in Ashland, Virginia, from which seven of her siblings graduated, and where she met my dad, a returning soldier who'd enrolled with the GI Bill. She was a member of the theater group, the annual staff, worked as a teaching assistant in English and math, and graduated in 1948. Right after graduation, she began her teaching career at Blackstone College for Girls, but interrupted that career the following year to marry our father, Hodge, a soon-to-be lawyer. In 1950, she had her first child, our sister Harriet. Less than two years later, she was ready to get back to work and began teaching at Pulaski High School, science, English, and math. By 1955, Roger and I had come into the picture, Daddy had a law practice, and our folks had purchased the Salem home where Roger still lives. The next year, Mom began teaching math and English at Andrew Lewis High School, where she remained for the next decade, teaching thereafter at James River and Lord Botetot High Schools as well. When asked, or maybe even when she suggested, She'd also design a parade float or produce a prom or a play. Although it's increasingly rare, one of her former students, one of whom is with us today, pops up from time to time. They recall her as a really good teacher, one who came early and stayed late to tutor those who needed extra help or comfort those who needed a shoulder to cry on. Roger can attest to her professionalism as well, since she taught him algebra one summer. It took his classmates a month to figure out he was the teacher's son. So much for any whiff of favoritism. 1956 also marked a life-altering challenge for mom. At age 30, she was diagnosed with cervical cancer. Local doctors thought she was a goner. But under the watchful eye of her sister Snooky, then a student at the Medical College of Virginia, she was treated with x-ray, cobalt, and radium. She survived and gained an incredible zest for life. But her long-held dream of having a dozen kids, yeah, I know, go figure, was dashed. As she continued on what would become a 30-year teaching career, She'd sometimes bring home students who were living in challenging circumstances. She wanted them to be in a household where the King's English was spoken and where, by having them help in the house or garden, she could pay them a little something so they could get needed toiletries, clothes, or shoes. More than once, she'd ask us three kids what we'd think of having one of these visitors as a new brother or sister. No thanks, we'd answer. We just weren't interested in sharing our rooms or her love. Out of the hospital and back at work, mom became president of the Salem Junior Women's Club and in the early 60s, joined the Salem chapter of the Eastern Star. After a rough beginning, 
She'd forgotten the password and couldn't get in the first meeting. Um, she and my father devoted themselves to learning the rituals and building star friendships. In 1963, they served together as worthy patron and worthy matron, a capacity in which mom would serve again in 1987. In 1990, with sisters Taddy and Snooky present, she was also installed as the royal matron of the Amaranth Roanoke Valley Court. While my sister and I were in college, mom invited our friends over to the house for conversation, a good meal, and a break from their normal routine. To this day, we still hear from some of them and others. One credits mom for listening to her tale of childhood trauma, helping her begin the healing process and learn to stand up for herself. A second says mom was the strongest woman she ever met and miles warmer and kinder than her own mother. Yet a third recalls that mom was welcoming and combined grace, dignity, and warmth. We always thought we had a great mom. Others confirmed that thinking. Once we were out of college, mom decided to go back herself, earning her master's degree from Hollands. Her thesis traced the stories of her sisters who'd had meaningful careers, prosecuting attorney, automated systems analyst, and medical doctor even as they managed their own families. She loved all of her siblings, especially Lydia. And she was proud of her impressive sisters. Sorry. When we girls married, mom welcomed John and Satch to the family, an honor Satch says was sealed the day mom poured a round of Pepsis and without asking, dumped some right into the milk glass he'd just drained. In 1983, she retired from teaching to care for daddy, who was in failing health. Then, in 1997, daddy, Tootie, and John died. Mom grieved their loss, but kept moving forward, showing us how to do the same. Well into her 80s, mom took weekly water aerobics classes at the Y. And Cindy, your mom, was right there with her, yep. Where other ladies called her Esther Williams, since she dove into the pool at the start of class. Never having cottoned to reading much, in her retirement years, she began reading nonstop, biographies and histories, mostly. She brushed up on her piano playing so she could play at the Star Chapter. She watched every televised sport available, and after multiple Super Bowl parties, we learned never to bet against her. She always picked the winning team. These are the barest of bare bones about her life. But what did that life teach us? Lesson number one, travel is the best teacher. That was A.W.'s belief, and mom shared it. She reveled in hitting the road, chatting up bikers in Sturgis during bike week, or struggling to land herself in a Caribbean sailboat after she dumped off for a swim. Each time she tried to climb back into the boat, she'd be hit with gales of laughter and would fall right back into the water. She enjoyed being a grand representative for the Eastern Star, representing Virginia to Saskatchewan and Alaska. Roger and she took a number of cruises. On one to Hawaii, they saw rainbows everywhere they went. Mom was delighted. She went from New York to California, Europe to Asia. Always open to change, she found in each place new slants on life. Lesson number two, partake of great feasts. Mom loved to cook, usually cooking from scratch, using fresh garden ingredients, chip, some you donated, or doctoring on someone else's recipe. When she served up what she'd made, she always made sure everyone had a plenty by serving herself last. It needn't be fancy food, and you certainly didn't need a reservation. So when you don't have the ingredients a recipe calls for, invent a new dish. 
If you're invited to a gathering, go. Once mom went to a teacher's Halloween party dressed as Miss Piggy. She wore a blonde wig, an inverted paper cup with two holes in it served as her nose. Finding she was the only one in costume, she enjoyed the party all the more. Lesson number three, don't miss a thing. Life is meant to be enjoyed. Seek out that brilliant sunrise or sunset. Stare in wonder at shadows on the mountains and shapes in the clouds. Turn up the sound when you hear that music you love. Roger once took mom to a Grateful Dead concert. <laughs> she thought they should join the gyrating dancers at the edge of the stage, likely stoned out of their minds. <laughs> Never forget to dance the night away or offer a helping hand. There were hundreds of these lessons, and there are many we've forgotten. But mom will remind us of them as often as she can. We think she'd take it kindly if we thought of her every now and again and smiled remembering our favorite teacher. Thank you, Lulu. That was wonderful. Will you stand with me as we pray? Let us pray to God, our creator, saying, Lord, have mercy. Loving God, you have called your people together in the mystical body of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. Lord, have mercy. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die daily to sin and rise to newness of life, and that we with our Redeemer may pass through the grave and gate of death to our joyful resurrection. Grant to us who are still on our earthly pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith, that your spirit may lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days. Lord, have mercy. Grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sin and serve you with a quiet mind. Lord, have mercy. Grant that Linny, increasing in the knowledge and love of you, may go from strength to strength in a new life of perfect service. Lord, have mercy. Grant to all who mourn a sure confidence in your tender mercy that casting all their sorrow on you, they may know the consolation of your love. Lord, have mercy. Give courage to all who are bereaved that in the days ahead they may hold fast to the comfort of a holy hope and joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. Lord, have mercy. Help us entrust Linny to your never-failing care and love. Receive her into the arms of your mercy and remember her according to the favor you bear for your people. Lord, have mercy. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion on us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Please remain standing for the commendation. Sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing, but life everlasting. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind, and we are mortal, forms of the earth, and to earth shall we return. 
For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints, for sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing, but life everlasting. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Jimmy. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in life. Amen. Now let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.